Okay, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity and um, looking forward to sharing some of our, our ideas with you. I'll share the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. Uh, today, we're going to talk about analyzing and strategizing in today's hot commodities. Before we do that, just want to introduce myself. If you're not familiar with me, my name is Carly Garner. I am a futures and options broker in Las Vegas, Nevada. We, uh, we're a boutique brokerage shop. We offer only futures and options. That's all we do. So we don't, we don't have stocks or traditional investments. It's all speculation, so it's higher risk, um, hopefully higher re reward, but there's no guarantees of that. If you're on social media, you can catch me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and our web address is decarlytrading.com. And if you have any questions or anything about uh, some of the things we talk about today, you can certainly email me or call me. There's all my contact info. I'm guilty of posting a lot of dog pictures. Some people love it, some people hate it, but just warning you before you follow me on Instagram. This is my beagle, Frankie. I do uh, additional, I do have additional job titles. It, I'm a broker, but I'm also an author. I write a column for Stocks and Commodities Magazine. I do contribute content to Jim Cramer's Mad Money and Bloomberg Television. I actually was just on Bloomberg before I jumped on this uh, webinar. And I write a couple of newsletters for our brokerage clients that uh, offer commentary, market research, trading ideas. And also I should add to this slide, I also uh, contribute content or, or go on RFD TV. It's a rural farming station. Uh, a lot of farmers and ranchers watch it. We're as a commodity firm, we deal with a lot of hedge business. So I do that a couple of times a week as well. And lastly, I have written multiple books. Don't worry about any of the other titles you might see if you Google um, or go to Amazon. These are the only three books you need to worry about. These are the newest, they're the latest and greatest. The others are out of print, uh, previous publishers, that sort of thing. So these are the updated versions. And before we continue, just wanna make sure that everybody understands there's a substantial amount of risk in trading futures and options, and trading is not suitable for everybody. We're going to talk about some of the uh, current market setups and situations shortly, but first I just want to give you a little primer. Why trade options? Not everybody likes options. Their options comes with a lot of fuzzy math and gray areas, and some people don't like that. But here's why some people do like options. Options offer flexibility. You can use various types of options, strike prices and expirations to pinpoint speculations, especially in today's markets. The futures exchanges have done a pretty good job at adding expiration dates. So some markets, like the stock indices, have expiration dates every day. That means if you want to speculate on what's going to happen by this afternoon, you can buy an option that expires literally in a handful of hours or maybe even an hour. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying you can. Uh, options generally provide less volatility than holding the futures themselves. That said, you have to really understand uh, what you're, you know, what you're doing and what you're dealing with, with, with options. It's very possible for someone to get into a lot of a trouble trading options in their mind. They might think they're being conservative because they're trading options, not futures, but if they're trading the wrong strategy or the wrong quantity, they can get themselves into a lot of trouble. Um, options also give a lot of room for error. In, uh, in my opinion, option spread traders or premium collectors are a little ahead of the game in that they don't have to be perfect in their timing or their speculation. However, if you're trading, if you're selling options and especially naked options, you do have to be aware of the fact that most of the time that short option is going to expire worthless or you're going to make, you know, maybe you buy it back before expiration, which is what we generally recommend. But there will be times that uh, on occasion, that option you sell turns into a, an unmitigated disaster. That's just how option selling is. It's a lot like insurance probabilities or casinos. They collect money over time, 
but every once in a while there's a really big payout that they have to suffer. Options generally come with lower margin and risk. Option spreads are generally less risky than futures. Again, I'm saying generally because people sometimes increase their quantity. Like the instead of trading one lot in futures, they might trade five lot in options. Well, guess what? You suddenly you've got a riskier trade than you would have if you just went outright long a futures contract. Options generally require less ca cash outlay. I'm going to show you a couple strategies today that will basically allow you to use the market's money to speculate with the trade-off is accepting unlimited risk. And time value erosion, erosion can work for the, an option seller and against an option buyer. We'll talk a little bit about that today as well. But there's uh, definitely some advantages to selling options if you can handle the risk, if you have the proper margin, but it's absolutely not for everybody. Trading is 99% mental. Nothing will out change my opinion on this. I've seen it way too many times. People using the exact same signals, the exact same strategy, the same signal service. So the same company telling them to buy here and sell here. And one can lose money and one can make money. And the difference is how they approach the market. If they panic, if they don't panic, their position sizing. So it's really just a mental game. In my opinion, using options, because it reduces account volatility and it gives you more room for error, it's a little less stressful. I'm not saying it can't be stressful at times, but it's a little less stressful. And if the game is a mental game, the idea is to keep your uh, wits about you. And you can do that hopefully by mitigating your stress. So hopefully trading options as opposed to futures will put you in a position to make better decisions. Options are building blocks. You can create a strategy that can accomplish anything with any risk reward prospect, any price target, any risk target. You're in control of the strategy that you create and you can be very creative. And I encourage people to be creative. Combinations of long and short calls and puts of various strike prices and expirations can be used in an attempt to achieve a common goal. Each leg of the spread may be antagonistic of the others. And that means they're working as hedges. Also, if you're using differences in time value exposure, you can mitigate some erosion obstacles. A few more things before we look at some examples. You really want to try to be cheap as an option trader because most options expire worthless. So if you're spending a ton of money on an option that's probably going to lose the value, it's going to be really hard to come out ahead in the end. Because they're priced to lose, in my opinion, it makes sense to strive to be cheap. Now, this could mean a couple of things. This could mean wait for a market that's really quiet and the volatility is low so that you can purchase options for low cost and hope that at some point during the life of that option, volatility increases and you make some money. Or you can sell premium around, in other words, sell options around the option that you're buying to help to finance that trade. But remember, nothing in life is free, especially not a free option trade. If you are selling options to help pay for an option that you're buying, you are, Probably, depending on how you structure the trade, if you're just doing a simple vertical spread, this isn't the case, but if you're really truly collecting enough premium to pay for what you're spending, you're going to have to sell more than one option, and or you're going to have to sell a different type of option. And either way, you're going to end up with unlimited risk somewhere. So because options are priced to lose, I believe it's generally better to be a, not, a net option seller. And if you uh, do it in the right way and put your risk in areas that are unlikely to be hit, hopefully um, you come out ahead, ahead at the end. But of course, like I mentioned in the beginning, there's no guarantees. We are not, we're speculating, we're not investing. It's a little bit different. We are not uh, guaranteed any type of return, but we can hope for the best. 
going to change my share to uh, a different screen. Hopefully, you can see this. Let me take a look here. Okay, sorry about that. So we're gonna go through a couple of, of trades here. These are trades that we recommended uh, to our clients. Now, obviously our clients don't have to, to participate in these trades and they're meant mostly for educational purposes. Um, you know, So even people that are trading, let's say they're day trading a mini S&P, hopefully these types of trades at least get them thinking about other strategies and different ways to look at things. So we're gonna start with the latest uh, trade that we recommended and it was put out on March 7th. So that was just yesterday. And this is in soy meal. I'm guessing that most of you probably have never traded soy meal before. It's honestly not the most uh, traded commodity in the world, but there's, some, there's an interesting opportunity here. We're looking at a market that's probably, now it's a little bit complicated because there was a cyber event a month and a month or two ago that interfered with the CFTC. That's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. It interfered with their ability to report on the COT report. The COT report is the commitment of traders. And that tells us which traders are long and short and by what degree. And because of the cyber event, we're not getting the data on a time in a timely manner like we normally would. So there's a little bit of guessing going on. That said, I believe that we're probably looking at the largest net long position in the history of soybean meal futures that we've ever seen. And if you see the same thing that I see on this chart, there appears to be pretty good resistance line here. And here, let's see if I can draw it. Well, I'm not very good at that. There we go. So there's a pretty good resistance line here. And then right about here, we could run into trouble. Now it's true. We might just break through and keep going, but that would be unlikely. Soy meal doesn't spend very much time above 400, let alone above 500. And that's where this mark is. So 500 is not only technical resistance, but it's psychological resistance. So what we suggested to our clients is, you know, don't necessarily jump in front of the bus, but you can get a foot in the door by buying a July soy meal 450 put. This gets somebody into the market with limited risk. The most you can lose is what you pay to get in. And if you can see on our newsletters, we provide a little description. I'm not gonna read that to you. I pretty much just told you why we think uh, soy meal might reverse. And then we put an idea and the, the idea is uh, basically again, buying the 450 put near 825. Now in soy meal, each point's worth $100. So 825 means $825. That's the most you could lose. If you consider transaction costs, you're looking at about 850 roughly. This was yesterday. I think they're a little more expensive uh, as of today, but this is the price that we were looking at yesterday. In theory, you have unlimited potential for return. Of course, there's, you know, soy meal is probably not going to zero probably not going below zero. So I hate to use the word unlimited in a situation like this, but if this option, let's say doubles or triples in value, which I think has a decent chance of doing, that would be a pretty nice trade. And what we're looking for is soy meal to get somewhere down towards the strike price and maybe even lower, maybe somewhere here in the 440, 430 area. To give you an idea, 10 points in soy meal is a is $1,000. So if the market was trading at 430 at expiration, the option would be worth a couple thousand dollars. You have to subtract what you paid to get in. If it trades to 430 well before expiration, that option's probably gonna be worth two or 3,000 because of the time value that would be still be included. Let's take a look at something that's maybe a little more uh, complicated.
This is a wheat trade that we put out to our clients on March 1st. Now, so far this hasn't worked out as planned, but sometimes, you know, that's how it goes, particularly in commodities. And especially when the trend is, is going in a certain direction, they say the trend is your friend until it isn't. And I think that's going to, what's going to happen here. People are just piling into short positions in the, in the wheat futures market. They've been doing so since uh, you might recall last year, we had a little bit of an event here. It was the Russian-Ukraine war. And there were some scares. People thought uh, the world was going to run out of food. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stories. And of course, just when everything was scariest, my mom called and asked me if she was going to be able to buy crackers in the grocery store anymore. I was right about here, right about $13 in wheat. And we've done nothing but sell off since. A lot of this has been obviously liquidation of all these longs. But we're also getting some speculative selling. You can see right here, every time the market attempts to rally, it just gets beaten to a pulp. And that's indicative of, of commodities. And sometimes people might look at a chart and say, wow, this chart looks awful because every rally gets sold into. And that's absolutely true. But that's how commodities are. And then one day you wake up and the, the market's up and it just keeps going. So commodities are a little different animal than uh, maybe some of the other financial products you're used to. We think that might be what's happening here. Uh, today, there was a WASDI report. That's basically a report that tell, that the government issues that kind of tells us what the supply and demand picture is like. Wasn't necessarily um, bullish for wheat, but it wasn't bearish. It wasn't any reason to buy. And so we got some selling coming in. But I think now that we've got the WASDI behind us, I think there's a good chance that we get some buyers coming on wheat. So this is a strategy that we suggested. This is a little more creative. So the idea is, we want to be long wheat um, from 725. So we want to buy a 725 call, but we don't want to pay for it. If you bought this call outright, uh, 23 cents is roughly a thousand, like 11, we'll call it 1200 bucks. We're kind of rounding, but it would cost you $1,200 to buy this option. Or instead of doing that, you could sell a 775 call and a, seven, and a 675 put, basically sell a strangle and collect enough premium to not only cover the cost of that long option, but collect a little extra. So the market's paying you about 200 to $250 to put that trade on. So not only are you using the market's money to buy your 725 call, but you're getting a little extra padding. It's covering your commissions and your fees and maybe even a nice dinner. But the downside of this is you have unlimited risk. So if we're dead wrong and the market's trades below 675, it's like being long a futures contract from 675 and you have basically unlimited risk. So uh, that's the trade-off. You're trading off cheap and a, a, a cheap speculation for unlimited risk. And sometimes that works out very well and other times it doesn't. Because this is uh, the short put it poses us, exposes us, sorry, to unlimited risk, that's the focus of, of the trade. That's what we want to offset first. So for example, if wheat rallies, the first thing we're going to want to do is buy that put back, take our profit, take our risk off the table. And then that'll leave us with a limited risk call spread that makes money from seven and a quarter to 775. You can't really see on this chart, but the reason we chose the 675 put to sell, it's this red line here, is because that's the September 2021 low. Now, can wheat go lower? Sure. We've seen wheat lower. Um, we've seen wheat as low as like $4 in the last decade or so. But I think we're in a new environment. Um, I'd be really hard pressed to see wheat get much under, under seven. But then again, I've been wrong before. That's just part of the game. Um, just for your informational purposes, we do offer alternative strategies. So. If, uh, Somebody that doesn't like unlimited risk might look to just do the call spread. So we offer that those kinds of details. And some people don't like options at all. They just like to be long futures. So another way to play this might be to just go long a mini wheat futures contract. Again, I'm not recommending you do that. I'm just saying this is an idea that we gave to our clients and I'll let them decide as long as they have all the information on risk and reward, they can make their own decision. I personally believe wheat has a shot at seeing nine to $10 again. I don't think we're gonna see 
uh, maybe even our lifetime. The last time we saw $13 wheat was, I want to say 2006 or seven. I, I apologize if I'm off by a year or so, but that was something that just occurred in a really odd, um, in fact, it blew up a couple of brokerage firms. I mean, it was just really a, a wild move. And it didn't last, and we sold off all the way to $4 within the next year. Um, this particular wheat rally was just as unsustainable, but I don't think we see $4 because I think the, the world has changed since 2020, 2021, um, particularly 2022 after the Russian invasion. So this is the details of the trade. We're buying the 725 call, selling the 775 call, selling the 675 put. There's two ways to look at this. Some people will look at this and say, I'm selling this a strangle. I'm selling the 725 call and the 675 put, and then I'm using some of the proceeds to buy this call option. Other people look at it as a bull call spread, buying the 725, selling the 775, and then selling a put to pay for it. So they, they call that a bull call spread with a naked leg. Like I said, this trade would have collected about 200 to $250. So the market's paying you to take on the risk. And if everything goes perfectly and wheat's above 775 at expiration, uh, the trade pays off a little over 25, uh, whoops, sorry, 2750. So less than three grand, but not bad for a trade that you didn't really pay to get into, assuming you can handle the risk. Now you don't wanna do this in a small account because if, some, if all heck breaks loose and wheat sells off, you wanna be able to withstand the pressure and, and hang on. Because the reality is being long wheat from 675 probably isn't such a bad idea. So if you wanted to just take delivery and hold on to the future, you would have to roll it into the next contract month pretty quickly, but that's one idea as well. So some might even look at this strategy as a way to get long from 675 if that, if that opportunity presents itself. But in the meantime, being long a call spread. I should point out the margin on this trade is about 2,500. I mentioned you don't want to do this in a real small account, but um, it only requires 2,500 to put on. So keep that in mind. I would say you probably want to allocate at least five, preferably 10 grand to a trade like this. Uh, some people look at that as diluting the profit potential and the return, but the reality is in this game, the you can't uh, you can't make money if you don't survive, and that's that should be the focus. So always dilute your leverage by overfunding the trade. Okay, let's look at another one here. So this is actually a pretty simple uh, recommendation as well. This was not a spread. Most people in this class probably don't trade sugar either. Sugar is a market that trades on the ice exchange. So it's not even on the Chicago Mercantile Group, which is the more popular futures exchange. It trades on ice. And the ICE exchange is, um, it's a little different. In, they operate a little differently. They charge a lot of money for price data. And so most traders just kind of stay clear of it. In our trading, in our brokerage trading platforms, it is possible to trade these products without subscribing to the data, but it isn't nearly as convenient as trading CME group that does have data available. That said, sometimes there's just opportunities there that are worth giving a shot. The nice thing about sugar is the options are really cheap. Sometimes I'm surprised at how cheap they are because sugar occasionally can move. You can see that uh, here, there's a pretty decent sized move from, I'm gonna round, but let's say 18 cents to 20 cents. That's a $2,000 move per contract in just a, couple, a handful of days. So sugar can move occasionally when it decides to. The reason we thought it might be a good idea to buy a sugar puts is first of all, if you look at this chart, you can see there's quite a few resistance areas. I would consider Bollinger Band as resistance, this trend line resistance, and then an out, uh, a secondary trend line as resistance. So there's a lot of thick resistance there. Also, if you've been trading commodities for a while, you know that 20 cents in sugar is kind of an unheard of price. Now we have been higher historically. There was a time in the 2000s, uh, let's say 2000, I'm not, I'm just totally guessing, but 
2009. Nope, probably 2006, somewhere in that ballpark. Sugar got up to 35 cents. So it has gone higher, but it spent most of the time trading around 15 cents or even closer to 10 cents. So this is really expensive for sugar, which is not surprising. I mean, we've seen a lot of commodities have big moves. But if you notice, most of the other commodities have given a lot of that back. Look at wheat. I just told you it was, went from $13. Now it's at seven. Uh, crude oil. I think we all know crude oil was at 130 last year. At one point, it was temporary, but it did happen. Now we're trading in the mid 70s. Uh, natural gas went from $10 to $2. So who's to say that that's not going to happen to sugar? In fact, it probably will. There was a time earlier la last year um, that sugar and crude oil were trading in lockstep. Whatever crude oil did, sugar did, and vice versa. That correlation has broken, but with crude oil struggling to hold its footing, I can't imagine sugar staying up here for much longer, but then again, um, you know, you just never know. We can't see the future. Also, according to the seasonal service that we prefer, which is MRCI, it's a more research center incorporated. Their stats suggest that selling May sugar futures on or about February 25th and holding through April 13th, so we're only talking a month and a half or so, would be profitable in 14 of the last 15 years. And also, we just recently went through a contract change. So the March contract just expired and people started trading uh, May sugar. Not always, but a lot of times during the process of rolling over and switching contracts, markets sometimes put in long-term tops and bottoms. So that kind of compelled us also to think that maybe it might be time to buy puts in, in sugar. The nice thing about just buying a simple put, you can see we're uh, suggesting maybe the 20 put in May sugar. The risk is limited. The most you can lose is what you pay to get in. There's zero margin. In this case, uh, you're probably looking after transaction costs, somewhere around $750 in risk. No matter what happens, that's what you lose. And if we're right and sugar rolls over, uh, theoretically your profit potential is unlimited. Of course, that's unlikely for something like that to happen. I would say if the option doubled or tripled in value, you probably should hang it up and, and move on. Okay, so this treasury trade, we uh, suggested a, let's see, on February 27th. So it's been a few days and it's moved in our favor a little ways, but I just wanted to point this out to everybody so they could kind of see how a trade like this might work. Now, being long or being bullish treasuries is not the most popular position at this particular time. Most people are bearish treasuries. In fact, um, I was just on Bloomberg today talking about this very thing. There are only, only about 26% of uh, market insiders that, that are polled by bullish, uh, let's see, it's bullish sentiment uh, index, I think is what they call it. Basically, in a nutshell, most people are bearish treasuries, and they're putting their money where their mouth is. On the 10-year note, we're look, sitting on the second largest net short position in history, according to the data I have available to me, so, and I believe that's to be a true statement. The only time speculators have been more short than they are now was late 2018. And at, at this particular time, again, I mentioned we're kind of guessing at COT numbers because of the cyber issue that's kind of thrown the government off and its reporting cycles. But we think there's probably 550 to 600,000 net short positions, and maybe there might even be more. We're, we're lowballing it intentionally because we don't want to mislead anyone. The record net short positions, about 750,000 contracts. So maybe we creep a lo little lower as more sellers get in. But the reality is everybody's short and everybody's bearish. And at some point, you get to a level where selling dries up. And the only way to get out if you're short is to buy it back. And if, that, if those shorts are motivated to do it all at the same time, or if we start getting a short squeeze, you'd be really shocked at how fast these things can move and flip the other way. And don't assume that you have to wait for fundamentals to change because that's just not how markets work. I know a lot of people want to uh, read and study and, and determine when Jerome Powell is going to stop raising interest rates and that sort of thing. 
Markets generally flip way before the narrative does. So if you're waiting for the narrative to flip, you're probably going to miss most of the move and, and you're probably going to end up chasing at the wrong time. Uh, those that are late to the party end up getting, getting hurt pretty badly most of the time. Not always. I mean, we just went off a couple of years in which trend traders actually uh, stole the show. Trend traders did very, very well in the last couple of years because markets were runaway. And, but that's kind of the exception, not the, not the norm. So in this particular strategy, basically the idea is to get long treasuries with a bull call spread, but without paying for it. And at the time of this uh, email that we sent to our clients, you could buy the 127 call for about 222. Now I'm not gonna go into how you calculate on premiums. It's really complicated, but you can just trust me on this. Um, that's about $2,300. So let's say $2,300. So you could, a trader could in theory, just buy the 127 call for 2,300 and call it a day. And if they're right, they might make a ton of money because uh, look at this is right near the money. It does, it's not going to take much for that option to pick up a lot of value. But like we said, it's usually good to be cheap. Markets, or I'm sorry, options are usually priced to lose. So a better idea might be to buy the 127, then sell a 130. And we're choosing the 130 because if you look at this trend line, if you look at this trend line, 130 is basically the top of the trend line. And so, sure, maybe we break out and go higher, but this is probably a relatively reasonable place to sell premium to pay for our trade and not be given up too much up, upside potential. On the downside, uh, we opted to look at selling a 120 put. Now, a 120 puts a little below, I'm sorry, a little above the October lows. Some people might not be comfortable with that because a retest of the lows would get that option in trouble. But what we are looking at is trend lines. Trend line right here, um, and even if we break through that, this is probably the, the, the pivot point where the market figures, you know, above 120, we're bullish, below 120, bearish. So that's how we're looking at it. Um, but in, in the end, this particular trade could have been executed for a net credit of roughly 24 ticks. That's roughly, I'm just gonna round here, it's about 20, uh, 350 bucks. So the market again is paying us $350 to take this trade on. All we have to do is accept the risk below 120. If the futures price gets to 120, um, the idea would be hopefully we're comfortable being long from 120 and we just kind of ride it out. You could also hedge it a little bit. You could sell a future against it, maybe buy a put underneath to limit your risk. So there's things you could do. You don't have to just watch, stand by and watch as uh, disaster strikes. But it's, these are tough calls at, at these levels because it can just as easily hit 120 and then be trading at 124 two days later. So you want to be careful. But the point is, um, if all heck broke loose and things went wrong and you're short the 120, you could be long a futures contract from 120 and just consider that a way to get long from a lower level while still having a foot in the door here from this higher level. You don't have to sell the put, you could just buy the call spread. Let's just take a look at that again. If you bought the 127, 130 call spread, it's gonna cost you about $1,000, uh, roughly, yeah, right at $1,000. And it, the spread's only worth 3,000. So the most you could make is two grand, but you're only limiting, you're only risking one grand. So you're putting up one grand to make two grand on that scenario. If you do sell the naked option, you're accepting unlimited risk below 120 to hopefully make about 3,300 if everything went perfect and you held to expiration. Now, these numbers that I'm giving you are if you hold to expiration. So that's, a, I should also offer this disclaimer. I generally don't recommend anybody hold the expiration. If you put a trade like this on and the market goes your way, take the money and run. No reason to, to squeeze out a little extra money. Like for example, if everything went perfect and this trade went in our favor in the next, let's say we put it on today and it goes in our favor in the next two or three, four days, and we can pick up 1500 bucks, you know, anywhere, but let's just say anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars in a handful of days. 
you should take it because to get that extra thousand dollar profit, potentially you're gonna have to hold 90 days. And in 90 days, anything can happen. Maybe our initial directional call was right. And then the market reverses and sells all the way back below 120. So you're gonna be real sad if you put the trade on, you made 1500 or more in the first couple, in the first week or two. And then next thing you know, you've got a loser on your hand. So don't be scared to get out and leave some money on the table. In fact, uh, I would encourage you to do that. So this position would have at the time of the recommendation uh, about 87 days to expiration, the margin's 3,600. So you're putting 3,600 margin up to maybe make about 3,300. Again, I'm rounding. 3,300 is only possible if you hold all the way at expiration. And keep in mind, I don't recommend you do that, but I'm just, this is the math. There's no way to predict what options will be worth before expiration. So this is the only way we can put the trade out with, with any kind of um, giving anyone any kind of idea of what's possible as far as risk and reward. Okay, we have one more, and this was uh, something that we had recommended on February 24th to our clients. Um, I believe it could be wrong because we have clients that some of them trade full service, some of them trade online, some of them we talk to every day, some of them we only talk to rarely. So I, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe most people got out with a pretty nice profit a day, a couple of days later, but I can't guarantee that maybe somebody uh, held, but anyway, with that in mind, this was put out on the 24th and the, I, the per premise of the trade is very simple trend line. It's just a trend line that started in October. We tested it in December and now we're testing it again. Uh, the market's currently right in this general area. And you notice it's also on the 200 day moving average or you, uh, I should say the orange line. You probably don't know what that is, but that's the 200 day moving average. That's the orange line. Some people consider that kind of the line in the sand between bull market and bear market. It's not, it's not quite that simple, but that is a, a simple way to look at it. And I got to admit, it, uh, it's actually a pretty nice tool. You can see the July of 2022 rally hit it and immediately reversed. That was definitely a bearish signal. In this situation, we've poked above it a couple times and failed, but now we've poked above it and we're holding. If this area holds, I have a feeling we could get a pretty big rally. I know nobody's looking for that and it doesn't feel like that's possible because every all the news is bearish and everyone's doom and gloom. But like I said before, the narrative doesn't have to switch for the market to switch. And I think the market's already switched. I mean, I'm not saying we're going to 4,900 or 5,000, but I think the crash or doom and gloom scenario is off the table. That's my opinion, at least for now. Maybe we trade mostly sideways for two or three years. That wouldn't shock me either. What we did in 2020 and 2021 was basically pull a lot of gains. For, we pulled years of gains forward, and now we have to pay for that. And that's kind of what we're doing, just digesting. I know it didn't seem like it at the time, but uh, that was very unusual to see markets moving up as fast and, and relentlessly as they did. So again, we, it sometimes uh, just takes time to work all of that out of, the, out of its system. This also is a bull call spread with a naked leg. The idea is we wanted to collect a little extra premium because um, we're bullish or we're neutral. Let's just say we're neutral to bullish. We're not necessarily looking for gangbuster rally, but we don't think the, the market's gonna fall apart either. And especially if we hold this trend line. So what we did was we recommended to buy the 4,100 call. So it's up here. It's not right at the money, it's up here. Sell the 4,200 call. And we did that because that's, the high from uh, January, I believe it was, maybe early February, it was 4,200 and then we sold off. So 4,200 seems like a place where if we sell some premium to pay for a trade, we're probably not gonna regret it too much. Maybe we will, but if we do regret it, then that's a good thing, right? Because every, the other two legs of the spread went our way. We're selling a 37.75 put to pay for this call spread. So the focus is on collecting premium. Uh, you'd collect about $750 to do this trade because each point in the E-mini S&P is worth 50 bucks. 
that $750 cushions your risk down below, but obviously um, it's not much of a cushion. So below 30, technically below 3760, you have unlimited risk. And the reason I say 3760 is we collected $15. So that 15 points uh, cushions are our break even point. Uh, just to give you an idea, if you wanted to go along the 4100 call without selling premium around it, uh, 71 points is, what is that, $3,500. It's actually $3,550. So if you didn't sell the 42 call and the 3775 call, it cost you $3,500 to get into that market. And again, more options are priced to lose. So unless the mark, the only way for you to break even if you did that is if the market was at 4171. Uh, so you've got to be right by uh, 200 points or more just to break even. With this version of the trade, you make money whether the market's uh, at 3775, 39, or above. So in other words, let me rephrase that. The only way for you to lose money on this trade because you're collecting premium to get in is if the market's below 3760. From 3760 all the way up to infinity, this trade makes money. So that's your only risk is down here. And we have been here before, but it's probably, um, in my opinion, it's unlikely. I don't, I kind of hesitate to use that word because you just never know. But uh, if it does get down there, it's probably a place that hopefully you're comfortable being long from. And if not, then uh, you could get out or hedge at any time. This trade pays off 100 points or $5,000 plus the premium collected if the market's above 4,200 at expiration. So that equates to about $5,700. The margin 7,250. Now I should also point out that not, uh, the exchange has minimum margins. With option spreads, they use what's called span margin. Span margin is a portfolio margining system that nets the risk of all the positions in your spread or even in your account. So if you're, if you have a bullish S&P trade and you have a bearish NASDAQ trade, it's very possible the span margin calculator nets those and gives you a little bit of a break. However, not all brokerages use uh, exchange minimum margins. Some brokerages charge above mar the margins that the exchange charge. So to put that another way, the exchange charges a margin and brokerages can choose to charge more or to charge the amount the exchange requires. Brokerages cannot charge less than the exchange requires, at least not at the close. Margins calculated at the close. Before the close, you can, what, how much margin you have on is between you and your broker. That's why some brokerages offer lower day trading margins than others because it's the broker setting the margin, not the exchange. But once you hold a position into the close, it's the exchange margin that counts and you must be within exchange margin. Depending on your broker, you may get a margin call if you hold positions into the close that you can't afford to hold, or your broker might just liquidate the positions. Some brokerages don't deal with mar margin calls anymore. They literally just step in and sell what they need to, or a lot of them liquidate the entire account. And it's a lot of times automatic, like a human's not even involved, just the computer does it. So you should always know who you're trading with and what their mar margin policy is and their liquidation policy, because those are um, quite devastating surprises. If you don't know you're liquidated and the market moves without you, or you know who knows what could happen. Um, so just to make sure you understand how this works, there's unlimited risk below 37.75. And the reason the uh, profit potential is 5,700 is the trade makes money between 4,100 and 4,200. That's 100 points, obviously. Uh, you take 100 points times 50, that's $5,000. We collected about $700 to get in. We actually collected probably a little 750 according to the numbers, but you take out transaction costs. So we'll just call it 5,700. If the S&P is above 4,200 at expiration and you hold all the way to expiration, it's not likely and it's not usually a good idea. I've seen so many people 
with winning trades that have two or three weeks to expiration. And instead of just taking the money and the risk off the table, they hold out because they're in their minds, the profit potential, let's say that uh, this trade's making four grand. They might look at this and say, well, I'm making four now, but in a week, I'm gonna make 5,700. But the reality is a bird in the hands worth two in the bush. You do not know what the market's gonna be looking like in a week, and it can be dramatically different. I've seen people give away or give back, I should say, a lot of profit just to squeeze out a small additional incremental profit. So be careful, don't do that. Don't be greedy. And again, I'm not saying that, um, what I'm saying is easier said than done because we're humans and that's how we're wired. Okay, I'm gonna go, just kind of go over with some of the things that we learned here. So I encourage people to get creative when they're creating option spreads. Spreads can be broken or rearranged. Uh, I mentioned in some of those bull call spreads with naked legs, if the market moves favorably, don't hesitate to buy that put back. The, the short put is where all the risk is. So once you buy that back and get it off the table, then you're holding a call spread. And even if things uh, turn around and reverse from there, at least you're not holding the bag on the unlimited risk. It can go the other way also. Let's say that you are you put on one of the trades uh, that we just showed you and the market sold off. So let's it's a bullet, most of them, and now they think about it, the spreads were all bullish spreads. So if the market sold off after you got in, you're going to be taking some heat on the short put. Your long call is going to be losing money, but your short call is also losing money, which is taking a tiny bit of the uh, pain away. You can always consider buying that short call back so that you open up the profit potential. If you still like the trade and you're still bullish, you can buy that short call back, lock in a profit there and wait to see if the market rallies. If it does, you have unlimited profit potential or you can always resell a call option to bring that premium back in, but there's nothing wrong with doing that. Don't forget options are building blocks. They can be built and taken away or taken apart, I should say, piece by piece to create the desired risk reward profile and adjust for changes in market conditions. Some people are programmed to believe that option spreads have to be put on and taken off all at one time. And that's just not the case. You can truly leg in and out of option spreads. Now, I'm generally not a fan of legging in because I feel like you're just uh, relying way too, too much on your, your own market timing, and that's, that's a tough game. But once you're in the trade and you see things are either going bad or good, you can peel a leg off and, and change your risk reward profile, and I think that makes sense. So uh, in a nutshell, you have to be in it to win it and thinking outside the box can go a long way towards keeping a foot in the door with an acceptable amount of risk. Um, some of you might be impressed by this. Some of you might have the opposite reaction to this, but Jim Kramer is a friend of mine and I know um, it may not always come across on TV, but he's generally one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. He's a very, very good person. And he's quite entertaining, to be honest. Uh, he endorsed my book, Trading Commodity Options. If you want to learn more about the book, you can even read some sample content. If you go to tradingcommodityoptions.com, it's there. And this is what the cover looks like. Like I said, if you Google or go to Amazon and search for our books, you're gonna find a book that has a black cover. It's called uh, Commodity Options. So it's slightly different title and it's black. Stay away from that. That's a really, really old book. It's the first book I wrote in 2008, I think it was published. And it's just old news. Basically this book is, uh, took that book and made it bigger and better. And, uh, Obviously, I've learned a lot from 2008 till now. This book was released a couple of years ago, and I've had some really, really tough lessons along the way. And so 
you really want to read about some of the interesting things and in, in how to deal with uh, adverse market conditions, this is the, the one that you want to focus on. I appreciate everybody coming out and uh, supporting us and supporting this event. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach us at decarlytrading.com. And once again, here is all my contact information. So if there's anything that I can do for you, please let me know. Uh, again, we are a boutique brokerage shop. We'd love to, to talk to you. We are, um, like I mentioned, we're located in Las Vegas, Nevada. Don't hold that against us. <laughs> but uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. If you're on social media, give us a follow. We try to share charts and commentary and some fun things as well.